Uh, it's good to be here with all of you, and uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, not only at VidCon, um, it's a return for me, but to be here with such good friends uh, and colleagues, Simone Sanders, Chris Hayes, Rashida Jones, the president of MSNBC, and Mehdi Hassan. Um, we are, uh, you know, I use the word um, family, and I really mean it. I think at uh, M MSNBC and at NBC News, uh, this is a place where um, you get to know your colleagues, you get to love your colleagues, and we all grow together. And I think that's why it's exciting to be here to talk about streaming on what is really, a, by the way, uh, a truly momentous, historic uh, news day. We're going to get to that in a minute, but before we do, I wanted to uh, show you guys a little video we prepared for all of you. Let's take a look. It's lining up to be next, next level in terms of impact. We are living right now what kids are going to learn about in their high school history classes. And they keep falling. The January 6th bombshells, that is. The next generation is watching, and the politicians are watching over what you can get away with or not. This country, despite all of our problems, we're still stumbling toward being a more perfect union. We are right now, for a whole bunch of reasons, in completely uncharted territory. Do we save democracy? Do we save Ukrainians? Do we try to save our own lives in the middle of a global pandemic? How do we make sense of all of this? I'm angry, and I'm a mom. And that just might be the answer to a midterm success strategy for Democrats. The Senate is the place where bills go to die these days. If it's 2022, there's an election somewhere on Tuesday. Staying up late is worth it. We just got news. That's where the drama is right now. It's a big night for American democracy. This is important. This is historic. This was Trump's claim. What we're going to hear today is from people on the inside. If Putin loses, he loses everything. This was a Russian camp, and you can see there's nothing left. Are you seeing this trend increasing among Latinos, right? Yes. More Latino Democrats going for Republicans. Absolutely. I know one thing really well, the Constitution and the rule of law. It's not only about the art, it's about the people. Our choice of weapons, GameStop. Accidents, spills. these activities went on for decades. Have you ever seen anything like this? We're happy to be so here. We love being on MSNBC on Peacock. Streaming now. There you have Good. it. And I should say, we should all say hello to the people who are watching us uh, streaming uh, at home or work, wherever you are, uh, as well. I, I think you know we have to address the news of the day uh, up top. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this is perhaps one of the most consequential um, news days, one of the most consequential Supreme Court decisions uh, in a generation. You might have heard uh, on your way in. You may just be hearing it now uh, for the first time, but that uh, in a six to three decision, the Supreme Court has struck down, overturned uh, Roe versus Wade and the federal right to abortion uh, in the United States of America, leaving it up to the states. Uh, and within a matter of days or weeks, you could see abortion uh, become illegal in as many as half of the states uh, in the union. And I want to just get right into it and start with, with Rashida. This is the 25th anniversary um, of MSNBC. You've been at the helm now uh, for about two years. Um, on a day like today, where do you see MSNBC fitting into the national conversation, both on our linear television channel and, and with streaming? Sure. So I think today in particular is a really good example of why it's so important for us to bring context to stories like this. For a story like this, uh, there's a lot of emotion. There are people who feel very strongly on both sides, and you're going to get that coverage in a lot of places. Um, what we bring to the conversation is a depth to what's happening, why is it happening, what does it mean, and to deliver a better understanding to our audience. And so that's really what our focus has been for now the last few hours, is really trying to put into context what's happening, who it affects, how it affects them. And, and to your point about both linear and streaming, our focus is not only bringing that depth to the audience, but bringing it to you wherever you are. So if you're watching on cable, if you're watching uh, on, on Peacock, if you're, if you're listening in the car, if, if you're following along on social media, our focus has really been how do we bring that content to you where you are in a way that provides the perspective that you need to understand what's happening. Chris Hayes was on the air, you were on the air, the night that this uh, draft decision uh, leaked. This was many weeks ago now at this yeah. point. Um, to me, what that said to me is, look, the importance of, well, first of all, let's talk about the decision, but also the importance of, of linear television and your broadcast. You do podcasts, you do live in-person events. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, but that felt like a night where, where TV had not felt as important uh, as it did to me in a very long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... Um there are moments, the hardest thing to do well, I think, is live breaking news. Mm. It's, it's very easy to do fine 
because the kinetic nature of the events drives people towards the television and you can always just kind of book people and talk. The hard thing to do is like have at your fingertips the knowledge and the, and the, and the people that you can call upon and a production staff that knows what they're doing to like make sense of something in the moment. And that was one of those moments. In fact, on that night we had booked, the last block of the show was gonna be about Dobbs about the court's wow. abortion jurisprudence. With no heads up that this was coming. We had no idea, and in yeah. fact, later- I was wondering how you got these guests. Like, <laughs> we had a ring Carmona on it, because I had that morning in the editorial call said, I think people are sleeping mm. on Dobbs. I think they're gonna do it, and I think it's we should just have this. So we had booked her, and in fact, later, later I saw a diagram that had been on floating around parts of the internet about the conspiracy theory of who had leaked it. And mm -hmm. part of the conspiracy theory that it had been a liberal who leaked it was that we had booked a guest that night in, in, in the <laughs> slot to discuss it, like this was the smoking gun. But to your point, like, what I think is great about us sort of embracing all these different platforms is that people are gonna get that same impulse in a moment like this to wanna hear people with knowledge and depth and context talk about what's happening is gonna drive people to us and to other places on a bunch of different platforms. So you wanna be present wherever people are at to be able to like have that conversation and also to kind of create some illumination in moments that feel very, very you know, scary and disruptive. Simone, you are in a unique position to uh, not only approach this uh, now as a colleague of ours with a broadcast of her own, but as someone who was inside the White House uh, as they prepared for the eventuality of this moment uh, coming to pass. Talk to us about what do you think uh, is going on inside the White House today? The president's scheduled to speak any minute now about this decision. He may be speaking as, as we're sitting out here, um, but also about who and, and, and how they're trying to reach the American people in the context of us being here you know, today at BitCon talking about streaming. So uh, the first lady, first lady, Dr. Jill Biden, was my first guest on my new show. And she said on the show that when the decision came, when the draft decision was leaked, she and the president were shocked. They were up in the residence. They got a call that said the draft decision was leaked. And they were absolutely shocked because they could not believe that this is what they were going to do. The president is someone who has been in elected office longer than I've been alive, okay? I'm 32 years old. Joe Biden served in the Senate longer than that. <laughs> and he is someone that has seen a lot of legislative fights, right? He's seen a lot of judicial fights, has been head of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and someone who I know uh, believed in the systems and the structure, believes in star deceases, believes in precedent. Yep. And so for this to happen, this is something, when the draft decision, when the draft came out, it was a shocker to everyone in the White House, the president, first lady, vice president as well. Um, and today, I just caught some comments from the president. And what he is saying is, this all goes down to the states. There's very little that the White House can do. And this has been a recognition that they've had for a very long time. Even before the draft decision, there were conversations we had on the campaign trail um, about if Roe was overturned, what would a President Joe Biden do? And he's always been clear, I would codify it in the law, but there were very few people, I think, that thought we would get there. On the flip side, there are advocates and people that I you know, have worked with for years who um, have been on the forefront of this issue that I have since had on the show because I believe, like Chris believes, people were sleeping on this. I had Fatima Goss Graves on uh, my MSNBC on Peacock show a couple weeks ago talking about the threat to Roe and what will happen when it is overturned, because it's not a if, it's a when at this point. Hello, draft decision. Um, and they have long since known that this is, this, this is where we're heading towards. Mm. Handmaid's Tale is not hyperbole. Um, Mehdi, let's get, let's get you in here. This comes uh, a day after another Supreme Court decision. Uh, you know, today we hear, um, that there's no federal right to abortion. Yesterday, there, we hear that there's a federal right to conceal carry wherever you are in a state like California uh, is not able to restrict that right. What do you make of the juxtaposition of what happened yesterday and what's happening today? So first off, I would say, if Chris Hayes ever asked you to go to Vegas with him, go to Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Second, I would say, uh, there's that Chinese proverb or Chinese curse, which isn't Chinese or a curse, which is may you live in interesting times, mm. right? And we live in some serious, interesting times. I've only been at NBC since 2020 and the number of his times I've had to say historic on the air is a lot and, and it's not hyperbole. We've seen a lot of historic things. Also, this is a week, Jacob, where 
The Reuters Institute put out a big study showing people are exhausted with the news. There's too much. They're being overwhelmed by the kind of negative news. And yet at the same time, everyone today is talking about Roe. Mm -hmm. Everyone's talking about impeachment hearings, insurrection hearings. Everyone's talking about these kind of midterms, inflation. There are a lot of big, big stories that are dominating the agenda. I think Rashida put it best. We talk about any story, we've got to bring context. Mm -hmm. We've got to find the interconnectedness. So many of the big stories of our time are connected. So when we talk about abortion or we talk about the gun decision, that to me is not different to the democracy debate that my show and our network has been focused on for the last 18 months, two years. Because the gun decision and the abortion decision is from an institution where five of the six Supreme Court justices were appointed by presidents who lost a popular vote, two of them credibly accused of sexual misconduct, one of them sitting in a completely stolen seat. That is the context for this decision. They've done something hugely unpopular, overturned 50 years of precedent, and the institution itself is questionable in terms of legitimacy. You look at the poll out yesterday, lowest point of legitimacy ever. So all these things fold into the same big picture, and that's where I believe those of us on this stage, whether behind the camera, in front of the camera, are trying to join those dots, are trying to say to people, this is all the same story. Right. This is not, you know, we cannot just cover guns in isolation from everything else that's happening in the Senate. We cannot cover Roe in isolation from the fact that this court is a counter-majoritarian court doing hugely unpopular things. And, you know, people say, um, Simone said, the president says going to the state. We know the president's going to say vote harder. Mm -hmm. We know the Democrats are going to say, let's pass a bill in the Congress. I was just telling Chris, you know, backstage, Congress can pass any bill it wants. This Supreme Court will shoot it down. Until you deal with the Supreme Court, mm. you can't get anywhere. So for me, on my show, I've I mean, we had Elizabeth Warren on when we launched in whenever it was, October 2020, feels like eons ago, <laughs> talking about Supreme Court expansion, one of the few senators who talks about that stuff. It's been a big hobby horse of mine for years. We've got to talk about the Supreme Court. We've got to talk about the Supreme Court. And we're able to do that. We're able to do that with excellent reporters at the network who break stories on the court before anyone else. And we're able to do that because some of the hosts here we have strong perspectives and we're able, as Chris says, to bring some kind of institutional knowledge, bring on great guests who can talk about this stuff and not just from a perspective of people are angry and upset, which they are, but also what do you do about it? What, what, what options are open to the public and what can we as the media, what questions should we be asking? My question that I'm asking from going forward and have been very much so is, what do we do about the Supreme Court? What debate do we need to have about the Supreme Court in this country? We, um... NBC and MSNBC has made a very significant investment in streaming. Uh, and in particular, you know, it's not lost on me at this time. Right. Um, <laughs> as someone who has failed probably more times than everybody in this room combined at streaming news as the <laughs> host of uh, several platforms that were going to be hailed as the future of news, HuffPost Live, rest in peace, YouTube Nation, <laughs> rest in peace, Take Part Live, rest in peace. Uh, even MSNBC, honestly, had, we had our own streaming network eight years ago before yeah. you were in this job, before many of us were doing what we're doing. It, it didn't work out. Why is right now, why is what's going on right now the right time to spend so much money to launch this streaming platform, which is entirely a distinct, while there's overlap, it's its yeah. own thing. So I think if you want to go to Vegas with Chris, you also want to go with Jacob because he's slightly ahead of the curve. <laughs> in a negative way. You break even. You kept break even, right? Indiana Jones with the ball behind That's him. That's why they're keeping me off of MSNBC <laughs> on Peacock. So really our focus is um, the audiences are changing. We know many of you guys you know, I'm not going to assume you're paying 200 bucks a month for cable. Many of you are consuming content in places other than a linear channel. My own kids even think we don't have cable, and we do because to them, cable is, <laughs> cable is this place where, or TV is a place where you get content, but they're not thinking about it as far as distribution. And so for us, as we're seeing the audience on linear television shrink, and it is shrinking, that is a reality, that is, the, that is what's happening. Despite the fact that we're getting more of the audience, it's just a, a smaller pie to be had. What we're looking at is let's go where people are navigating to. Let's take our content to places where they're already consuming and where, they're, where there's growth and there's a runway and where there's a future. And so that's really what drove our focus in, in the streaming space. And we look at it as a holistic effort across the news group. We are not, not just MSNBC investing, but as a news group, we're investing. So you've got hard news content with NBC News Now. If you want to find out what's happening with the SCOTUS decision, after this panel, not this second, <laughs> you can go to NBC News Now, distribute it on any platform, any, any streaming platform that you have, and that's where you get your hard news. If you want the depth and the perspective and understanding in the likes of Mehdi and Simone and Katie Fang and, and others, you go to MSNBC on Peacock. If you want to know 
what smart thing Chris Hayes said last night, if you want to know this morning or this afternoon, you go to MSNBC on Peacock. And then if you're interested in lifestyle content, we've got today all day. So our focus has been, let's take all of the good of what we do, and in addition to what we're uh, presenting to you on a linear platform, let's take it to a lot of other places. And, and, and really, how do we tap into what we do well and, and take it to more places? MSNBC on, oh, I should say that we haven't even brought up the January 6th hearing. I mean, we brought them up, but, but we haven't gone in depth on them. The January 6th hearings have exponentially increased the audience on MSNBC on Peacock. I think 8x over yes. the, the, the average uh, audience. We've been the number one cable network across the board for each of the hearings uh, and each of the uh, the post shows you were on last night because you were flying out here. But um, is that the type of content that's going to attract people, do you think, to this product? It's a premium product. People have to pay for MSNBC uh, on Peacock. Is it going to be based around uh, live events and is that what's going to draw people in? I think it's a combination. I think it's everything um, that is MSNBC. It's when the live event is happening, how do I find out what's, what's going on? When the live event has happened, how do I listen to a Chris Hayes to understand why it happened? And, and what does it mean for me? If it's also topically, there have been times, and, and Medi's team has done a really nice job of this, where there may be a topic that's not in the news, but we spend a little bit more time and do a, a, a one topic hour dedicated to it. How do we take an interview with a Chloe and, ha and Haley, 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 I'm Haley. a little old, <laughs> Haley, Chloe and Haley, <laughs> that Simone might bring to her show uh, on either cable or streaming, but it's a different audience, it's a different focus. We get to do not just one thing in the streaming space, we get to do a lot of things, and I think what people are seeing is you get a holistic experience because we're not just one beat, where there's breaking news and our numbers spike, and then there's nothing else to come back for. We wanna make sure there's plenty more to come back for. You, in some way, were the tip of the spear when it comes to sort of um, diversifying your, your platforms within the networks of NBC News and MSNBC. I mentioned earlier, you did with Pod, Why Is This Happening podcast, you have in-person live podcast events. I think you guys have a little bit of an announcement today about you might be resuming your uh, live studio audience shows that you've been doing. Are you... <laughs> You just oh, want to be yay. everywhere? Or, yeah. First of all, confirm, you learn something is that true? Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to bring those back. Yeah. Um, the last one we did actually was here in Los Angeles on a studio lot uh, the day before the California primary in 2020. We were supposed to do one the next week in Michigan. I was like, I don't think we can get a bunch of people into a room together. A little thing called COVID. Um, so, take, but take us inside your thinking. Why, why were you, you were so far ahead of everybody else in terms of deciding to expand that all-in brand within MSNBC? Yeah, I think because I, um, I'm i someone who gets my news and information from a bunch of different sources. So I'm a big podcast listener. So I want to, like, I love podcasts and I want to make podcasts. I love live events, you know, and that's the kind of thing I'm into. So I wanted to do that. I love, like, being part of the sort of kinetic feeling with an audience. I like, it's funny, like I even consume my colleagues in all sorts of different ways. I'll see a monologue that Mehdi did. I watch Simone's show like on my phone, you know, through the app, you know, a, a day or two later if I'm like on the, you know, in the car or something, yeah. like not driving. Um, <laughs> and like, so, so to me, um, being able to kind of, basically there's a group of people, I realize there's a group of people that I know and love and who would, maybe like what I have to say, who aren't necessarily watching me at 8, 8 o'clock. I mean, a huge thing of it, honestly, I'm, I'm, I have three kids. I got a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 4-year-old. Like, people my age with those kids, like, 8 o'clock is a tough time. Like, at that age, you're not, you're doing bedtime, you're like, mate, like, it's tough to hit that. So I want to be accessible and available to people, you know, in other ways. So, Friends of mine I know who can never watch the show live, right? They'll watch it the next day. Or maybe they don't even watch the show, but they do listen to the podcast, mm -hmm. right? So that was a big part of the thinking was I want to be able to, you know, create stuff that I'm into that I would like to consume myself that the people who may not be able to watch the show can also enjoy. When you came, Simone, I read that you said, I want to make sure I get this right, uh, something to the effect that you wanted to come to a place where there was a significant... Uh, investment in and focus on the, the streaming presence. Yeah, an established track record. Why is that? Why was that important to you? Because I think while um, look as a as a former communications person for my entire career, the television was important, right? What is happening on TV matters. I have picked up the phone and and called everybody on this panel at one <laughs> point in time. Like, what was that? <laughs> so it matters. But streaming is 
not just the future, it is the right now. I am 32 years old and I can tell you when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is not turning on the television. Right. I check my Twitter, I check my Instagram, I check my email. Um, when I listen to the news, the first time might be when I get in the car to turn on Sirius XM. Right. And then that's where right, I am right, hearing right, it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go to a place where there was an established record in, in doing that, where we could do some evergreen things. I interviewed Chloe and Halle Bailey, the, you know, the pop superstars uh, last <laughs> week, and we talked about, they had just, it was Juneteenth, so we talked about <clears throat> Juneteenth. They were at the vice president's house, but they also just performed. Chloe dropped a song. That is something, we played a little snippet on my MSNBC show, and then long form, it was available um, on Peacock, and we played it on the Peacock show on Monday and Tuesday. So I think that, um, creating content for people like me, the non-political group chats who they are like, they are looking at the news today like what is happening. I want to hear from some people with some context about what is going on, but they also want to know like, what is Lori Harvey doing? So I'm interviewing her today too, and we're going to drop that when, this when, weekend. When you were in the White House, uh, Dr. Fauci and the president and even the vice president held these sessions with, with creators, with you know people who have, uh, I've never felt less famous, by the way, walking around at VidCon, <laughs> Uh, but there are people who are being chased around um, <laughs> rapidly uh, that maybe some of us may have never seen before. Those... Millions of people are following That's lots right. of folks that probably some people in this room on this uh, Zoom. They are, yes, those so what, people what matter. What can we learn? What can all of us learn? What can a, a network like MSNBC learn from the, the sort of that engagement strategy that the White House has been very forward on? Yeah, AOC was streaming on Twitch with Hassan Piker. I mean, politicians are getting it. Are news networks understanding it? Are we there yet? I think we are on our way there. I think MSNBC definitely gets it for sure. Um, and bringing on different content creators as, as parts of shows, as parts of panels, partnering with them on different things. It's not just being on these different platforms, right? Because I can be on TikTok, but what, are, what am I giving the people? Right. I can live, I can Instagram live, but what are we, what are we doing? Right. Like, is the content engaging? One of the things we do on our show, on the MSNBC show and the Peacock show, I have something called the Culture Corner. So on Sundays, you can tune in for the Culture Corner. It's usually at the end of the show, same thing on Mondays. And I bring in people who do not do politics. They are DJs, some of them are, I've had TikTok, stars on and they are commenting on the things that are in the group chats so we talked about drake and his album and like honey this is not hip-hop but what are we <laughs> is it, is i still it like it kids? i still like it okay see chris is in chris you're a yes chat? you're I a mean, yes yes i'm a I'm yes a... you're a maybe, I'm a maybe. People say that. why we people... do another listen why Stop. This is the culture corner right here, folks. We just, okay, tune in, Simone. We'll clip this and put it on the show. I'll, so, I'll say this, because yeah. I'm a, I'm a middle-aged dad, it's actually, it's good music to write to. <laughs> all right, all right. Which, which is maybe a definitely my question thing to also, say. That's but. why it's a maybe for me. You see, this is key. People <laughs> just, you see what I'm talking about? There are, the political conversations are important. Yeah. It is the, it is, I've made a career doing that. I think it is critical. I think everything in our life is politics, but... There are so many other things that people yep. are discussing and talking about, and they want an yeah. avenue to see that. Or, or, go ahead. Luke, I, I just had a, I had a funny moment the other day that felt like a big moment for me, which was that a monologue I did came up on my TikTok for you page algorithm. <laughs> but I was like, oh, look at that. Look at that guy. That's me. <laughs> and I, but but that, that made me happy because I, like, I spend a lot of time on TikTok these days. Yep. Um, Same. And I'm pretty fascinated by it, and it's like, it's pretty deep in my mind. And so I was like, okay, we're there too. That's good. Yeah. Uh, what we call the demo audience, I think, what is it, 20, 20, 25, to 25 to 54. Yep. People here are, are 13, 11, 10, 12. Yeah, I mean, they're driving uh, consumer choices. They're, I mean, th that is a extremely powerful uh, uh, group, block. I know they're probably too young to be news consumers in a traditional sense, but have we given up? I mean, is, is television, not us, but has television given up on going towards that younger demo? Is there a way for us to reach young people who are here running the halls I of the think Absolutely. It's a little bit of what Chris and Simone said and a lot of what um, Medi has been doing, which is this idea of taking the content, adjusting it for the platform and bringing it to, to different audiences. And, and Medi, I know you spend a lot of time um, curating your, your Twitter presence in a way that I can get the rant, I can get the monologue, a million other people will get it too. Who don't watch cable. Who don't watch cable, and yes. that's how you're, you're bringing that content to other people. But Twitter's for old people, right? That's the, that's so. the other problem. So that's why we and Chris have to go on TikTok now yeah. uh, with our kids. My, my, fif us. my 15. Oh, <laughs> I'm Simone. scared. I mean, Simone, we wish we were, we were your age. Um, 
My 15 year old is mortified that I'm on TikTok and our TikTok account <laughs> is very lively and we're doing a lot of TikTok stuff. And I never thought I'd be on TikTok. I'm in my basement in a t-shirt making TikTok. Forget TikTok, you have an amazing story about Peacock. What did you know about Peacock when you were I mean, pitched streaming, to doing a show? I was late to streaming. I'm very, I was very late to stream. My streaming is like Netflix, right? Not news streaming. <laughs> and Phil Griffin, who is Rashida's eminent predecessor, rang me in the summer of 2020. And I was binging on Ozark and binging on junk food in the lockdown. <laughs> he said, do you want to host a show on Peacock? And I said, what's Peacock? <laughs> As I furiously Googled on my laptop while I yes. spoke to him. And then, <laughs> and then I said to my agents after, I was like, do I want to go work for Peacock? Is that a good career move for me? <laughs> and in hindsight, it's been a great career move for me. I'm a man who regrets a lot. I went to Disneyland yesterday. I regretted a lot of lines. <laughs> I regretted a lot of lines I stood with my kids. I can honestly say I don't have any regrets about Peacock or NBC because it has given me these platforms right. and the freedom to innovate. You know, people talk about editorial freedom, which we do have, and I love it. But even more important than that right now is a kind of innovative freedom to right. be able to say, like, I went to these guys, not to Rashida per se, but to my executive producer on my show, and I was like, uh, a guy called Ben Mayer at the time, who's a very straight shooter, and I said to him, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna do all of Donald Trump's achievements. This is a, all of his craziness. This is the night before the election in 60 seconds. I wanna do it in 60 seconds. I want you to put a timer on it and we're gonna have a buzzer at the end. I was like, this is a crazy idea. And we did it and it had like 1.2 million views and it was substantive, it wasn't crazy. We went through all the stuff, stuff that Jacobs covered like family separation, everything else. We turned that into a thing. And that's now a thing that exists. We just put it, the, the, what, last week's one, we just put it on TikTok. It's had something like 200,000 views on TikTok in a day. So that stuff that we're proud of, it's kind of fun, it's quirky, it's not the kind of stuff you traditionally get on cable, but it works on social, it works on different platforms. And I've always seen all these platforms as interconnected. I don't see cable here, right. streaming there, Twitter there, TikTok there. Some people try and use social media. The old way was, like even two, three years ago, as marketing recently, tool. it was a marketing tool, right? right? Uh, how do we boost the show with the Twitter account? That's not what we do now, and we never should have done that. Now it's, how do we use the best content from the show to boost Twitter, to boost our TikTok presence? Like the Mehdi Hassan Show TikTok account, which I'm sure you're all following, uh, shameless plug there. <laughs> we have five times, I checked this, because I thought I'll have a stat for you all. We have five times the followers that the official Fox news TikTok accounts because Fox doesn't care about TikTok. Fair enough, their audience is like 95. But, but like even the CNN official TikTok account, we, our show, our little show has half the total followers of CNN. That's not because we're better than CNN, it's just because that's what we're focused on right now. That's what we think is important. And because we're not just dumping content from the show on there, that's the key. Yeah. Like nobody in this room wants to be insulted in that way to say, we're into social media and streaming. We're just gonna put whatever we did on this old network for you. That doesn't work. And that's why on our show, and Rashida kindly mentioned that, like we do think about that. There was, there was a time when you would say, oh, how's this gonna play on social? And we'd feel embarrassed about it. We don't feel embarrassed about that now. When we talk about the show Four Blocks, I say, well, this block is a block that will work in different platforms as well. And it's, we're not, that's, not, that's not a shameless thing. That's something we're proud of. Mm. Uh, the clock is telling me we're done, but I, I would love to get, Rashida, your final thoughts on, on where we go from here. Where would you like to see MSNBC on Peacock uh, be you know, an, another year, two or three years from now? Yeah, I mean, we want to continue to grow. I want to find opportunities for more innovation, whether it's creating content that's uniquely and originally for that platform. You know, we briefly talked about Chris's live shows. I, this is a place where we can experiment and we can go do a live studio audience show that's specifically programmed for a streaming audience that's maybe longer, shorter, a slightly different format, that's slightly different from the cable audience. So more experimentation, I think, is gonna be um, important for us. And I would also say new faces. This is also a place, because linear television is exactly that. It's ve very linear. There are 24 hours in the day. There are only so many shows you can launch, so many people who can host them. But in the streaming space, because you've got VOD options and live options, you've got much more real estate to try out some new things. You can throw some uh, spaghetti at the wall and see if it sticks, but bring in new voices, new perspectives, people who yes. look more like America, and yes. that's really what we're focusing on. Okay, pleasure to be here with all of you guys. Pleasure to be here with all of you. Thanks yeah. so much for being here. And go right now, turn on your uh, MSNBC. Uh, on any platform. Watch. On any yeah. platform. Whatever you use. Or, or Mr. Beast, who I hear is best. That's true. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.